You're listening to Power Talk, Berkeley Electric Cooperative's official broadcast about the cooperative, our communities, and ways to use energy wisely. And now, let's join our hosts for today's episode. Good morning, Low Country. This is Libby Rorig, Director of Marketing and Communications here at Berkeley Electric. And we have a great show for you today. Um, two very special guests, uh, Tony Vincent, my boss, Vice President of Public Relations at BEC. Welcome, Tony. Good morning, Libby. Good morning. And Avery Wilkes, Vice President of Communications at the Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina. Welcome, Avery. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for making the trip down to Monk's Corner. We're excited to have you. Um, you know, we always get the show kicked off with a couple introductions so our listeners understand kind of where we're coming from. Tony, you're a return guest to Power That's Talk. Right. Your fan club's been writing, demanding more shows. Exactly. So. What's it been, three years since I did this, I think? <laughs> Two, I think. Yeah. yeah. Hasn't been in this new building yet. So. No. Yeah. So uh, both of you have the official Power Talk mugs. That's right. Yeah. Um, very exciting. They have Good not made it. co-op swag here. <laughs> they have not made right it yet there. to eBay. So I'm looking at you two if they do uh, from here. <laughs> but, uh, so Tony, just uh, remind the listeners a little bit about your background and what you do here at the co-op. I'm interested in yeah, learning that's right. myself. I do a lot of stuff. Libby. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to take that during the show. Um, probably been here about 10 years. So from South Carolina, got on with Berkeley as the key account manager. Mm. So started out and did probably five or six years as key accounts, which was, you know, our large loads, Mm -hmm. um, our commercial um, accounts working with them. And then I did um, economic development some, and then I registered as a lobbyist and I did our local government and our state government. And then four or five years ago, when Mark retired, I took this job as vice president of public relations. So now I'm over your department, which is communications and then Eddie and Bert with energy services Mm -hmm. and economic development, all of our government relations. So I joke in our staff meetings and I say our department talks for a living. Mm -hmm. It's pretty accurate, right? We're kind of the outward facing group um, Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And so that's, that's what I do. Well, thank you. Yep. Avery, welcome again to the show. We're excited to have you in studio at Berkeley Electric today, and um, we're thrilled that you're leading the communications function at our statewide organization. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Yeah, I've been at the Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina for a year and a little less than a year and a half now. Um, I'm a lifelong South Carolinian, grew up in a small town called Chester, South Carolina, which is about right. uh, Where does that? Yeah, about halfway between Charlotte and Columbia on I-77. I went to the University of South Carolina, where I studied journalism. Uh, Initially wanted to be a sports writer. Uh, I had big dreams of going on ESPN one day or working for Sports (laughs) Illustrated. I did that for four years while I was in school at USC. Got to cover Steve Spurrier's Gamecocks and Don Staley's uh, women's basketball team. Nice. Uh, the early Frank Martin years. Uh, he was a very mean and difficult guy to cover, uh, but, uh, but had a great time doing that, but realized that that was not going to be for me long term. Um, kind of got burned out from covering sports and it made sports not fun. Yeah. So I, I went into just covering general news after that for the state newspaper after I graduated. And I covered everything from runaway goats on my first day oh. to uh, the, the state house and politics and business and courts and crime. Uh, ultimately got stuck on the Alec Murdoch crime and corruption got saga. stuck on it. Stuck. That's right. Yeah, I, they, they, it was not willingly. Uh, <laughs> but I was not a true crime guy, but I did cover uh, sort of financial crimes and corruption, and, and, and that, uh, that case took on a lot of that. So that's how I wound up on that story. Um, went to the Post and Courier, and that's where I did a lot of that coverage. And uh, I was on their investigative team for three years, and uh, that covered that six-week murder trial there in, in Walterboro. And a week later, I, I came to work here for the co-op. So uh, very much enjoyed being here and, and telling the cooperative story. Oh. Wait, did they find the goat? Was that really your first story? <laughs> so uh, it was my first story. I didn't even have a computer that day. Uh, that was September 9th, 2015. Okay. Um, and I was literally like signing all the HR paperwork and benefits information while also trying to track down what was happening <laughs> with this goat. There's a goat named Dalebert. Uh, he lived Delbert. in basically an off-campus fraternity house. Uh, the, uh, oh, the, the, the guys there thought that uh, having a goat would 
help attract uh, uh, ladies to the house because huh. they would think it would be cute, and they also thought it would be a good way to. It's a terrible idea, right, um, Libby? Yes. Right, um, just chime in on that. They, okay. they just didn't Puppies? want to uh, uh, cut their own yard as well. Ah, uh, uh, so they're lazy go. and dumb. Yep. The problem Got was it. that uh, <laughs> the goat Check. would get afraid during storms and oh, hop no. their six foot fence and then run around. And so, it, in this particular yeah. case, it was missing for about eighteen hours, as I recall. Oh. And uh, it kept reappearing in people's backyards and front yards, and so all the neighborhood. This was like the lizard man. Uh, it kind of was yeah. for a little bit. But, <laughs> this um, was your lizard man. But eventually they did catch the goat, and uh, it went to live on a farm in okay. Camden and okay. lived happily oh. ever after, uh, as, I, as I recall. Okay. Yeah. Let's hopefully it. And that put you on the scene. Actually, to you a know farm. what I'm saying? That was. I mean, it, <laughs> there have been worse for stories and introductions to it's better to than the Murdoch trial. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Certainly, wow. certainly, it all went downhill from there. I there would say. <laughs> well, um, Avery, I too started in newspapers, um, and also my husband. Um, my husband is third generation newspaper man, mm. and his son. Um, we're really proud of him. My stepson uh, is Jay Bender's replacement really? at Press Association. Okay, so, yeah, Taylor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know yeah. Taylor Smith. Yeah. yeah. So uh, very small state, and especially in, in journalism circles. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I worked with Taylor closely at, at times when I was at uh, yeah. both the state and the Post and Courier. Yeah. And his dad is also Taylor Smith. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course, Jay as well. Jay is a, a character. Jay, yeah. And uh, he was our media liaison to the judge during the Murdoch trial, making yeah. sure we got access to various information we yeah. needed, exhibits, documents, uh, and also access to the courtroom as well. So, so Tony, Jay Bender is the Eddie Plowden of media law. That's okay. true. That's actually yeah. a That's great, great. Yeah, I know <laughs> That's a really good description of Jay. I was, I was and, lost and there I love, for a second. I love, you know, he's one of those people that's <laughs> beloved universally, uh, a character, and uh, one of the first people you would call if you needed a colorful quote about something going on yeah. with the Freedom of Information Act or spice it up. government secrecy he's, or, yeah. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah. And still engaged, just retired. Um, Absolutely. Just when he wants to be. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Best he, place he to be. It. I was about to say. Yeah. So my husband ran the Walter paper for really? 18 years. Wow. So Again, very awesome. small state. Yeah. Also, I was an editor in high school <laughs> on my yearbook. So I feel like I just need to get in this conversation. So <laughs> I was assigned a page and I put pictures on it and stuff. And yeah. So there. It's a big job. Yeah. I'll big take job. that. All right. <laughs> Very big job. <laughs> well, um, when you join the co-op world, we'll bring this back on track here. Um, you know, I was thrilled for us because, you know, it's great to have a, a, a smart uh, guy oh, wow. on our team. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Words um, I haven't heard about myself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure mom thinks that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, sure. Maybe. <laughs> but, you know, as someone who is still very devoted to the fourth estate, you know, I, I knew it was a huge loss to the journalism industry. So welcome to the team. Yeah, glad very, very glad to be here. And it's been fun to see things from a different perspective and uh, still get to kind of work in and around news. I talk to reporters all the time. Yeah. Basically, anytime I'm in the car, I'm, I'm calling somebody and just checking in, seeing what they're working on, how we can help, that kind of thing. Cool. So still feel like I get to be in the mix of it a little yeah. bit. And uh, it's just different being on being on this side of things, but different in a, in a fun and cool way. Yeah. Well, and the skills translate so well, you know, um, building relationships, building trust, you know, all of that, both sides. Um, that's very necessary. So absolutely. Yeah. Having credibility, having something yep. to say and being able to, to convey it in a, in a clear and effective way is, yep. is always going to be important. Yep. Well, thanks again for joining us. Um, and to our audience, today we are talking politics. And with that, everybody just turned off the radio. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, you know, as unpleasant as politics, you know, has become for some of us in the past decade, you know, they're critically important. You know, they, they guide so much of our lives. And this year is a general election year, and um, we'll decide uh, our next president. So, and But there are so many other choices on the ballot. Um, you know, Congress, state legislature, some local offices. And I would argue those are probably more important than whoever's occupying the White House. But um, kind of depends on what your position is, I would sure, imagine. Sure. But, so, Tony, you know, why do co-ops care about politics? Why are we talking about politics today? Well, so when I say politics, I think it's easier for people to understand when I say like lawmaking. At the state level, every year in Columbia, they probably make dozens of laws, pass, pass them every year. And out of those dozens of laws, there are three or four that affect the co-op. So it's one of those things where you're either at the table or you're on the menu. Yep. 
I register as a lobbyist. I go to Columbia. My job is to build relationships with the lobbyists that represent our members and engage with them and let them know how this bill affects Berkeley Mm Co-op, whether it's our reliability, our cost, um, all kinds of things. There was a bill a couple years ago that said that our statewide organization could train our own drivers. It saved us a ton of money, and they needed to know our stance on that. And so that's why we're involved with politics, so that we can be a source for them when they have bills that come through that affect the power company, so they can know how this affects us. What does Berkeley think about this? They can't be subject matter experts in everything. So when a bill comes across about the power company, I hopefully I have a good enough relationship with them that they call, text me, and say, hey, what do you guys think about this? Yep. How's this going to affect Berkeley Co-op? Are you for it? Are you against it? Are there any amendments you would want to see on it? And that's why we do it, so that at the state level, we can be a part of the process that is ultimately going to affect how we do business, what we charge, all of it. Yeah. And as a not-for-profit member-owned cooperative, fighting for Berkeley Electric means fighting for our members. Sure, because sure. They own us. They That's right. bear the the result of whatever happens at the state house. That's exactly or, right. Yeah. I'm literally there on behalf of our members. Yep. So all of our members, I go there and I, I stay in those lanes. I don't talk to anyone about bills that have nothing to do with the power company. Mm-hmm. That's kind of one of the, the things they know they get from us is that we are not going to branch into other things. We get asked our opinions on things. And mm-hmm. if it has nothing to do with electrons going down lines, you're not going to get an opinion from me about it. Yeah. But but you're absolutely right. We are there on behalf of our members to do what is best for them at the state house. And I think lobbying gets this really bad name, especially mm-hmm. at the federal level. And it's yeah. really not that at the state level. I covered the state house for four or five yeah. years, and the lobbyists at the state house are really there more as as helpers yeah. of the of the legislators because they are part right. time. Um, you know, they they all have second jobs. Most mm-hmm. of them do. Or, or first jobs, really, in the legislature yeah. is, their, is their second job. Uh, they aren't paid very well. They don't have these large staffs like, uh, like members of Congress mm-hmm. do. And so they rely on, um, you know, on, on lobbyists to actually tell them what is going on and help them understand issues. It's less about trying to change their mind. It's more about just helping them understand what's going yeah. on. So I think at the state house, it's, it's far more important than most people realize. Yeah, exactly. And Avery, we saw this reality play out where um, this past legislative session where there was um, a need for us to help educate uh, our legislators at in um, Columbia. Um, cooperatives supported a bill that would create um, major new power generation for our rapidly growing state um, for the first time in decades. So unfortunately, it failed to pass. Why was that? Yeah, this was really a long evolving issue. It was something that I think cooperatives first looked in the face in Christmas 2022 when um, several major utilities across the Southeast had rolling blackouts and cooperatives nearly had rolling blackouts. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of utilities, including the co-ops, started looking around and saying, look, we really need more power. Um, And if we don't get it, if we don't get the ability to bring more power onto the system, build new generation, build new transmission, things like that, we run the risk of a future where where we have to live with blackouts. And that's not something yeah. that we think South Carolinians will accept. So there was this bill, uh, H-5118, that made its way through the House and then got to the Senate. Ultimately, it, it stalled in the Senate. Uh, senators really just wanted more time, we saw, uh, to get comfortable with major provisions of the bill. That happens a lot with legislation. Yeah. If you think about big issues, uh, that have passed or are still waiting good. to pass. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Legislators, for the reasons that we just talked about, uh, you know, they don't have full-time staffs to investigate mm-hmm. a lot of these issues, but sometimes it takes them years and years to wrap their heads around an issue and feel comfortable with what they're passing and see how it's worked in other states mm-hmm. or hasn't worked in other states. And so we saw that's really what senators wanted. They wanted that time to study, to investigate. Um, they've talked about forming a sort of blue ribbon study committee for the rest of this fall to uh, sit down as, as senators and bring in people mm-hmm. to hear testimony um, and to to make sure that they fully understand the issue and fully understand the ramifications of every part of that bill. It got to be a very long bill. It was upwards yeah. of, yes, of 80 pages. I think at one point it was 97 pages, uh, depending on your font size. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so that that's a terrible. lot for legislators to, to, to draft and then yeah. consider and, and pass uh, in a single year. So ultimately how it played out was the house passed the bill overwhelmingly they had been studying that issue in the off season they'd held hearings 
Um, the Senate didn't get as much time, and so they passed a stripped-down version of the bill that took out all the, you know, the, the action items, but basically included, you know, whereas clauses and, and other language that said, look, we recognize that power capacity is an issue in South yeah. Carolina. We want to address it, and we're going to take steps to learn more about this and study this issue and then come back to the table at some point, either later this year or more likely early next year, and come up with legislation that we feel comfortable with to mm-hmm. ultimately uh, pass it and deal with this issue. Awesome. Well, if you're just joining us, you're listening to Power Talk, uh, the official broadcast of Berkeley Electric Cooperative. And I'm jo- I'm Libby Rorg, Director of Marketing and Communications, and I'm joined by our Vice President of Public Relations at BEC, t- Mr. Tony Vincent, and our Vice President of Communications, Avery Wilkes, from the Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina. And we are talking um, politics and grassroots efforts to um, educate and engage our members today. You know, this past legislative um, session, although um, a bill that the co-ops were uh, very much in favor of um, failed to pass, um, it was good exercise of mobilizing this online grassroots efforts that we have called Voices for Cooperative Power, or VCP for short. It's a program that makes it uh, easy for our co-op supporters to learn about and weigh in on important policies that affect co-ops and therefore the communities that we serve. Um Avery, you know, this was a, a good test drive for you as well for VCP. Tell us how it works. Absolutely. So for for decades after co-ops formed, how they did grassroots politics was word of mouth. It was mm-hmm. in person. It was uh, physical letters and postcards to members of Congress in the state house. Um, and those methods were very effective because they were real people. Um, showing up with their voices and, and making sure that their representatives understood where the co-op stands and where the co-op's members stand and where rural South Carolina stands on various issues. Mm-hmm. What Voices for Cooperative Power allows us to do is translate all that to the digital space, uh, and to a more online world mm-hmm. where a lot more people operate via email versus mm-hmm. physical mail. A lot more people operate via social media mm-hmm. than via word of mouth. So it was just another tool for us to use that was a little more efficient, a little faster, and and easier, frankly, for our members to get involved in the political process. Yeah. Now, not everybody enjoys politics. Uh, I certainly didn't before I was paid to, to work in politics as a reporter. <laughs> but um, our goal was to make it as easy as possible for people to engage in the process mm-hmm. and make sure that co-op members were heard at the state house Because we know that that other utilities and other other groups were being heard at the state house, um, and and we don't have the the money. We don't spend the kind of money on yeah. politics that some of the bigger players do. But we have lots of people uh, who agree with our message. And so, essentially, our our idea was, and what we use with uh, how we use voices of uh, cooperative power was to engage people via direct email and via social media with messages about what was going on at the state house mm-hmm. and how you can help. So we explained, you know, reliability is up, uh, up up on the table for for discussion at the state house, and there's a bill that's going through the legislature um, that could either help us or hurt us. Uh, yeah. You know, I think at the point we'd engaged it, it was a bill we were we were very much in favor of, mm-hmm. and so we were looking for people to better understand what the debate was at the state house, and then take a step to to engage in it. Um, so we were able to activate. A large number of people to push the South Carolina House of Representatives to actually pass this bill when it was on the House side. I think they passed it by ultimately a vote of 88 to 21. Hmm. And that was after a 48 hour Voices for Cooperative campaign uh, that we ran Mm -hmm. um, and and didn't really have to put much money into it all just for paid social ads to make sure people saw it. But we got nearly eleven hundred letters or emails to legislators on the house side letting them know and those are from not from us those are from members Mm -hmm. Uh, it had their address at the bottom so that the legislators would know hey this is actually a person in my district yeah not a Um, bot basically saying you know hey we're we're in support of this we need this we need to ensure that the lights stay on in south carolina let me just let me just chime in right there sure so when i started eight or nine years ago there was an epa ruling Mm -hmm. that we thought was going to make the price of power go up and so we did a card campaign that's right and it was that weird hybrid we got all these cards signed we still ended up putting them in an excel and sending them Mm -hmm. we would have it was effective in the sense that we were able to get the word out we were able to get our members to sign these cards saying yes 
we think that this regulation needs to stay the same. We could have never done that in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. It was impossible to do. And so this, just the ability now to see this bill and to see it needs an extra push, right? They're voting in three or four days. We need to let our members know so that they can let their elected official know how they feel about it. We would have been up the creek eight or nine years ago without this kind of ability. Absolutely. And it's, it's so, you know, to be able to pull off a campaign like that in 48 hours was, right. would, would have just been unheard of beforehand because you would have needed to uh, get all your messaging straight and then yeah. put out print materials yeah. and, and get the word out. And it just would not have been possible, um, you know, yesterday or, or in yesterday's age. Right. But but today where we have social media and we have email and we have mm -hmm. the ability to push a button and have people somewhere else in South Carolina see it. That's, That's right. a really powerful tool for co-ops to be able to use to get their people uh, educated on issues yeah. going on at the state house and then get them involved. And like I said, we we don't have and don't spend that kind of money on politics to to uh, buy ads and, and influence people and, and mm -hmm. spend money on campaigns and things like that. But what we can do is get our members involved uh, so that our legislators know where real people in rural South Carolina stand. Yeah, and it's definitely an education tool. So, you know, if you're served by a cooperative um, and you want to sign up to learn more about it, you know, go to voicesforcooperativepower.com and it'll take you through the steps there. But, you know, if there's an issue that comes up and you don't agree with the co-op's official stance, you don't have to do anything. So it's just, it's wonderful to be engaged and to learn more and to know I don't have to reach out if I don't agree. I don't have to do anything. You That's know, right. I can just totally learn optional. more. Yeah. Um, you can also follow Voices for Cooperative Power on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So, um, you know, again, just a, a wonderful um, educational tool for folks and, you know, co-ops care very much about their members getting reliable and affordable power, but we also care very much about our members being engaged in the democratic process and, you know, That's your right. voice matters. So, Tony, we're talking about all the need for new generation. Why are we running out of power in South Carolina? So, growth. I mean, there's no other way to say it besides growth. And he kind of alluded to it. Th this was brought to the forefront two years ago, Christmas Eve. Yeah. It almost got real bad in South Carolina. Yeah. Um, I laugh with with Mike. I've said this before. There's days that I wish it would have got bad. If if we would have had an outage for 30 minutes while everyone had relatives in town trying to take hot showers and cook for a massive lunch, yeah. I think we would have gotten everybody's attention. Instead, oh, yeah. the legislator went, see, y'all got this. We're good. Yeah. And everybody in the power industry knows we were real close to not being good. Yeah. So this county, fastest growing county in South Carolina in the last four years, Berkeley County, mm -hmm. um, South Carolina growing leaps and bounds. Yeah. Lots of people moving here. We have had growth as a, at the state level for the last decade. And when you couple that with the last time new generation came on for Santee Cooper was 2007, 2008. That is when they built the last two units at the local um, coal-fired generation plant. So you're looking at almost two decades since we've made new generation, and yet we have continued to grow at 3 and mm -hmm. 4%. That's going to run out. So yeah. the, the math just doesn't work on that. Yeah. Um, in that span, there has been a, a coal plant that did not get built, and of course we all know that there was a nuclear plant that also did not get built. So we have there's been attempts that were unsuccessful, and here we still are almost two decades since we've built new generation and everybody and their mother is still moving to South Carolina. Yeah. And so we're just, we're coming up on this, like he was saying, where other states have rolling blackouts. Um, we don't want that to be us, but we are coming yeah. up on a point where something's got to give. And co-ops are very much an all of the above strategy That's right. for generation. We love solar panels as much as anybody does, but it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. You know, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, and battery storage isn't quite there yet. And, you know, I know at Barclay Electric, we support rooftop solar for our members um, on their homes if they'd like. Um, and, you know, we've worked with Central Electric to do some um, larger ins installations of solar farms. But, you know, we we need some good base load, reliable power um, added to our system. And we tried to say that at the state house, and I think we'll get a better shot at it next year when we say we do believe that there is a new way moving forward, whether it's small modular nukes, something is coming and something, but we got to bridge that gap. 
And so we really tried to say that with a combined cycle power plant. Yeah. We're not saying it's going to be here forever, but that helps us to get to where we need to get as a state. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, it just, um, there were some people that wanted to know more about it before they were ready to vote on it. And that's fine. We'll hit the ground running, yeah. um, you know, next session. It'll be here before you know it. And that'll be right back on the block and we'll try our best to get new generation for South Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we talk about the future of, of power, uh, power supply and, and small modular nuclear reactors, you know, uh, sound like a great option. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you know, hoping that battery storage advances so you can actually store solar power, uh, and, and be able to use it at times when the sun is not shining. All those things we are very optimistic about. That yeah. we, we're, we hope that they will become available and be cost effective mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, very soon. Yep. But hope is not a strategy, right? And so <laughs> you, right. you need to, uh, we talk about the need for a bridge fuel, yeah. which, which we believe is, is natural gas and gas fire generation. And, uh, and obviously not a lot of people, uh, or, or some people are, are critical of that because natural gas fire generation does create carbon emissions, but it's about, um, you know, was it half the carbon emissions of coal fire generation, right. which we are still running in South Carolina. And so gas is a way to ensure that we keep the lights on, uh, in the meantime, while we hopefully get to that more clean energy future, uh, but it provides that bridge from where we currently are in our in our energy mix, where we've got coal and and gas and, and nuclear and all that on the system to a to a cleaner energy future, while still keeping the lights on. And yeah. and like you said, you know, we don't want to get to a point where we're like Texas, where a storm rolls through, yeah. or they have a really cold snap, and and the power is out, and people are literally dying by the hundreds yeah. because yeah. you can't keep the lights on, you can't keep the power on, and, mm-hmm. and the heat running. Uh, we don't want to get to be like California or, or some of these other states where they put all of their eggs in one basket. We want to yeah. be resilient. We want to be diverse in our in our fuel mix. And we want to make sure that we're looking to be um, as affordable as possible mm-hmm. and also, but, but reliability is really paramount right. for us. Yeah. And, and we want to continue to have an, eco, uh, an economy that grows in South Carolina. We want large industry to look yeah. at us and, and still want to come and locate here. And that's some of the questions they're starting to ask, you know. Well, and the other side of the generation issue, um, and Tony, half of your department works on this very hard, is conservation. Yep. You know, Berkeley Electric, uh, you know, while we support members putting solar PV at their homes, we also work very, very hard to help them conserve energy right. and make their homes more energy efficient and reduce energy consumption, particularly during peak usage time. Mm-hmm. So the coldest Um, times of the day during the winter and the hottest times of the day during um, the summer. You know, that's part of the formula. And if you're listening to this uh, show thinking, well, I can't get a nuclear plant built. What can I do? You know, you can look into some of these programs to make your home more energy efficient and um, shave your usage just a little bit. It all adds up. But, well, Avery, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, You know, since you're relatively new to the co-op family, can you send us out, you know, telling us some of the biggest things that you've learned about co-ops and, um, you know, your communications function at at statewide. Yeah. I mean, I'm still very much drinking from the fire hose. (laughs) I'd I'd known about co-ops a a little bit before from uh, covering them and covering the VC summer uh, issue at the state house. But man, I still had a lot to learn uh, (laughs) about what co-ops are and how they work. And of course you say, um, if you've been to one co-op, you've been to one co-op. They're all very different, independent, autonomous, but uh, one thing we did that's been very helpful to me is we started a marketing uh, campaign shortly after I arrived called I Heart My Co-op. Mm-hmm. And so we would literally go out and just interview people yeah. at annual meetings or other events. Or uh, if we if we found someone on social media who was saying something positive about their co-op, we'd go and put them on camera. And we interviewed more than 150 of those people mm-hmm. over the past year. And hearing what they had to say about their various co-ops really helped crystallize for me what co-ops are all about. Yeah very helpful to me as as a person who needs to communicate about what co-ops are all about but um, we started to see some some themes appear things like how great the service is how different it was from other utilities that these people had been uh, served by in the past um, quick response times after storms yep. uh, things like broadband you know a number of co-ops mm-hmm. are getting into the internet service business and yep. providing high-speed internet to areas that had never had it before and we're still on dial-up even in 2021 22. Yep. Uh, things like energy efficiency programs mm-hmm. like like you guys have here at Berkeley Electric, really just a ton of stories about co-ops going the extra mile to help their members in a way that you wouldn't think most utilities would. 
And so that has been very helpful for me to know that I'm, I'm working for the good guys. That's really important for me. Um, and uh, it's been a crash course for me in what makes co-ops great and what makes co-ops different. So that is my positive note to end on after all this talk <laughs> about politics. Well, like I said, we're happy to have you part of the co-op family. And, you know, today we've been talking about Voices for Cooperative Power. It's a program that makes it easy for co-op supporters to learn about and weigh in on important policies that affect co-ops and the communities that we serve. We'd love to have your support. To sign up for Voices for Cooperative Power, go to voicesforcooperativepower.com or follow VCP on Facebook, Instagram, um, and LinkedIn. You know, thank you for tuning in to Power Talk today. This is the official broadcast of Your Electric Cooperative. You can catch up on past episodes on streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple, and iHeartRadio. Get a behind-the-scenes look on Berkeley Electric's YouTube channel. Thanks. Have a great day.